Welcome to the Bilingual Montessori webinar series. Hello, I'm Amy Tobias with Bilingual Montessori. We are here to support you in building stronger bilingual programs. This series has been made possible through Erasmus Plus funding by the European Union. In this webinar, we are joined by Dr. Elvira Masura from Greece, who is a researcher in the field of basic cognitive mechanisms, such as memory. She will share with us different studies, including her own, that provide objective data about bilingualism and cognitive development. Elvira is a psychologist and is currently the director of the Psychological Laboratory of the Department of Psychology at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. Her education includes a psychology degree from Aristotle University, a postgraduate diploma in mental retardation and learning disabilities from the University of Kiel in England, and she completed her PhD at the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Bristol also in England. Avira has participated in research projects abroad and in Greece. She has presented her research at international and national conferences and has published papers in international scientific journals, books, and conference proceedings. She's a member of several international scientific societies, such as the team with two languages, which is the Greek branch of the Bilingualism Matters Network of the University of Edinburgh. She joins us to share some history about bilingualism, her insights of the advantages of bilingualism, the importance of working memory, and what answers she has discovered to her own questions about bilingualism. Welcome, Elvira. We are glad to have you join us and give us your researcher's perspective. Hello. Uh, I would like to welcome you in this webinar. Uh, the title of my talk is um, Cognitive Development Among Children and Bilingualism and um, Users of Several Languages. Uh, my name is Elvira Masura and I'm based in Thessaloniki. Okay, so learning multiple languages and children's cognitive development. I'm very happy that I'm going to give this talk because I live in a place where there are very many languages spoken. Thessaloniki is a place where uh, it used to be um, a place for several populations. It's not exactly like that now, but it is still a multicultural and multi-language city. And I very much like that I'm going to give this talk about multilingualism. This is um, within my, my, my research interests and um, I'm happy that I will share this with you. So multilingualism and bilingualism used to be something bad for cognitive functioning for several years. So we use, I mean, us as um, researchers, we used to view multilingualism as something negative for cognitive function. And that was because um, we, we, we've seen that Multilingual people and multilingual children had lower performance in verbal intelligence tasks. Also, it seems that multilingualism had negative influence on general intelligence. Also, we noticed that children that were multilingual or bilingual, they had lower vocabulary in both languages. So it seems that multilingualism was something bad for children and for their cognitive functioning, but that was several years ago. Now we know better, and now we're talking for something completely different. Now we're talking about a bilingual advantage. And this advantage is not an advantage in life or in, in friendships or in, in other activities. The bilingualism advantage is an advantage on cognition on cognitive development. Now we see bilingualism as something good for children and for their cognitive functioning. Why? Because now we notice that they had better performance on cognitive tasks, 
So when we compare monolingual and multilingual children, the multilinguals and the bilinguals perform better on several cognitive tasks, particularly in some very difficult cognitive tasks. Um, for example, in inhibition control, and I will explain what inhibition control is, they perform better and they outperform their monolingual peers. Also, they have better performance in non-verbal tasks. So it seems that bilingual is, is something good for cognition. It's something good for the mind. I asked Chat GPT what multilingualism and bilingualism is. It seems that Chat GPT is, is very clever, gives a perfect um, introduction for bilingualism. It says that it refers to the ability of an individual to speak and understand two different languages fluently and gives all the description. This is very, very good, very uh, accurate. But also, it seems that the advantage on cognition of bilingualism is, is also there. Chat GPT says that bilingualism has many cognitive, social, and cultural benefits. The cultural benefits and the social benefits are very obvious, but the cognitive benefits uh, is very important, and it, it seems that it has been recognized very, very widely. It was not like that forever. So why, why we should expect bilinguals and uh, multilinguals outperform their monolingual peers in cognitive tasks? Why would expect bilingualism to be so beneficial for cognition and for the mind? Maybe because the use of the two simultaneously active languages that possibly they compete to each other, this may work as a natural exercise for cognitive functions. Um, sometimes there are some people who refer to bilingual mind as a zogler, as a very active, very well exercised um, um, person, as something very, very fit. There are several studies. This is a study that I like very much. Uh, it's called the Hyderabad study. It's years ago, but I like it very much because, because this study has been run in a very natural environment. That this is a city, a very big city in India. There are several languages spoken there and the bilinguals and the multilinguals are not um, children who have um, parents with two different languages. They're not immigrants. They, they live in their place and they speak several languages. And this is very natural. Almost everybody is bilingual there. And um, this is um, very interesting because what they did is they found 648 patients with dementia. They had all dementia and they separated them in bilinguals and 60% uh, uh, of them were bilinguals and 40% were monolinguals. It's very rare to find a monolingual. Possibly they were uh, people who, who moved. Um, I don't remember exactly the details. And they had a very interesting observation. They found that the bilinguals with dementia have been diagnosed a bit later than the bilinguals, um, than the monolinguals with dementia. And that was four years later. Um, so it seems that if there is an advantage of bilingualism, this advantage not only gives benefits to cognition, but also protects the brain from aging. And if, if bilingualism has the ability to give you four years without dementia, it is something very important. Um, Let's see if it is exactly like that and if the bilingual advantage is always there or there are some times that we miss it. The, the, the argument that bilingualism is something very good for cognition really went far too way. So this is a real uh, newspaper uh, with bilingualism being something 
uh, the perfect situation that you can be um, because bilingual people are smart, creative and better lovers. Of course, this is not true, but this is an example of how far the research on bilingualism went and how evident um, and, and how many people believe that it is very, very good for cognition to be bilingual. We as researchers are not very certain all the time and we want to, to question things and we, we need data for everything. So we doubt a bit about things. But uh, the population that are bilingual seems that now it is a very huge population. 3.3 billion people are bilingual in the world this, this moment. So 43% of the population, some of them speak uh, two languages, some they speak two, three, four, or five. So the bilinguals are not a tiny minority of very lucky people. Uh, bilinguals are most uh, or a great amount of the population in the world right now. So that may that uh, is something that made researchers being very interesting on bilingualism. The research, and this is um, an estimation of the published articles on bilingualism and multilingualism. This is a graph of the research that has been published on bilingualism lately. So from 1946, very, very, very few articles, very few articles, and then lately, very many articles published. This is the to um, uh, 023, so there are some more to be published. It seems that we know better. It seems that there are data, there is research, uh, bilingualism is something very interesting, and this knowledge that has been accumulated gave some answers to our questions. The main question is, where exactly does the cognitive advantage lie? Where exactly in cognitive system? In memory, in language, in uh, decision making, in attention? This is a very important question. Where exactly? Where exactly in the cognitive system is the advantage of bilingualism? It seems that the executive functioning, and I will explain soon what executive function is, is the system that can be benefited more. Executive functions has as main role to supervise, control, and regulate our behavior and feelings. Executive functions are very important cognitive tasks, very useful for our everyday life because they supervise and control almost everything that we do. They are separate from the other basic cognitive skills such as memory, attention, and visual perception. We can refer to executive function as a managerial board, as um, 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 the boss of our, mem of our cognitive system. So something very, very important. They are very necessary to perform complex behaviors in order to meet a goal and to adapt in a range of changes and record my requirements of the environment. So if this is the system that can be benefited from bilingualism, this is very important. Let's see what exactly the executive functions are. We agree that there are several executive functions and the most important are those three here, the inhibitory control, the update, and flexibility. The inhibitory control is our ability to restrain ourselves is our ability to use the most uh, appropriate behavior and to inhibit the one that it is not very appropriate for the situation. It is very important for several things. The other executive function is update. Our ability to continually update incoming project related information and ignore the information that are not related to the task that we have to perform. Again, very important function. Also, another executive function is flexibility. This is our ability to alternate our thinking between two different concepts and the ability to think simultaneously about multiple concepts. Some people refer to flexibility as switching. Okay, very important. 
Also, there is another system. This is not an executive function. This is a memory system, like working memory system, that it is responsible to manage and restrain information over short periods of time. Those are the systems that seem to be benefited from bilingualism. Let's see how and why, and uh, most importantly, let's see when this happens. Um, let me explain a bit more about working memory. This is a memory system. Um, it is very important because it holds information and also processes this information over short periods of time. A very good example to understand what working memory is, is to imagine yourself when you try to do mental arithmetic. When, for example, you are in a supermarket and you try to estimate how much you are going to pay and you try to add every item you put on your basket. So this is um, the working memory system that you are using to remember the prices and to make them additions. Okay, very important. Or um, working memory is a system that you use when you drive in a place that you don't know and you ask for instructions and you have to keep in your mind the instructions while you are driving and you, you, you try to find the place um, you want to go. This is our working memory system. Keep information and also process information. What is um, the relationship be, between, uh, between bilingual advantage and working memory? Unfortunately, there are no conclusive evidence. It seems that researchers, they don't agree on what exactly going, uh, goes on between uh, working memory and bilingual. So, uh, Angel, in um, uh, 2012, they found that no differences on visual spatial working memory function between monolingual and bi bilingual children observed. They, they find nothing. No differences on simple verbal span and complex verbal span between monolinguals and uh, bilinguals. Again, the same team of researchers. But there are some other labs that they did find a difference with bilingual being better on spatial working memory tasks. So some people found it, some people failed. Um, we have to explain why in, in research, when you have contradictive findings, it's not always a bad thing. This is an opportunity to find out why researchers disagree to each other. Working memory is a very complex system, and this is one of the reasons why we have those contradictive findings. Working memory is not a simple system where information is held. It is a system with several subsystems, and each one of those systems is specialized for specific information. So one, one model for working memory is this one, and describes working memory as a multi-component system with a special place, the phonological look for verbal information, um, a special place for visual and spatial information, the visual spatial sketch part, um, a different system for binding the information, they call it the episodic buffer, and a chief, uh, a central executive system that controls the information within working memory. So um, this is a complex system. Um, uh, uh, the information goes to long-term memory after it's, it's held in working memory. And this is one of the reasons we don't know exactly what's going on between working memory and bi ma um, multilingualism and bilingualism. Maybe the advantage lies somewhere in one of the systems and leaves the rest of the systems intact. Again, I asked Chad GPD what working memory is. Again, the um, description of working memory is correct. And also, um, uh, it is here that the differences between people on working memory capacity and uh, says at the end that working memory is considered a critical cognitive function for many everyday tasks, such as, such as reading, problem solving, decision making, and learning new information. So it's not strange that maybe learning new information can affect working memory if you are using your working memory a lot to handle two different languages. 
to different phonological systems, you may exercise your working memory, you may improve your working memory, and um, some researchers fail to find this improvement for several reasons. We have contradictive findings, as I said. Some studies question the executive function advantage in bilinguals, and some others they found it. Some recent studies failed to replicate results, and some studies did not find at all. Some studies, studies claim that bilingualism and working memory, a comprehensive meta-analysis, they found that there is an effect there. Um, it's really not conclusive. And what I will try to do here today is to give some possibilities why we have this contradictive data, why we're having conflicting data. There are several possibilities. One possibility is that the bilingual groups are not heterogeneous. When we compare different bilingual groups with different monolingual groups, possibly we, we make totally different comparisons. Um, it's not only the amount of languages they, they spoke, the bilinguals, but it also what kind of bilinguals they are. So this may lead to different findings and different results. But very interestingly, monolingual groups are not the same too. They, they might differ uh, in what kind of bilinguals they are. I'll show you um, a very interesting study. What they did is that they compared two monolingual groups. They were monolinguals. They, they uh, didn't speak any other foreign languages. And they were living in different environments. The ones were bilinguals who were living in California, if I remember well. And they were monolinguals in an environment with multi languages spoken. And the others when, uh, were monolinguals who were living somewhere in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is not a place with very many languages. It's not multilingual as California. And they compared them with, um, with uh, methods, um, with um, neuroimaging methods. And they found they differ. They differ uh, on their ability to learn vowel harmony in Finnish. So it seems that even if you are a monolingual, who live in a monolingual environment, you have a different brain from a monolingual who lives in a multilingual environment. So we compare different things and this can lead to conflicting data. It's very difficult to control everything in research. The other reason why we have so conflicting data is the tasks we're using. Especially for working memory, different labs use different tasks. And if we don't use the same tasks, you don't assess the same system. And some of the tasks are in different languages. And this is very important for uh, bilinguals and for multilinguals. And even if the instructions are in the language that it is less used, this may uh, affect um, how the bilinguals perform on these tasks. So using different tasks with different groups, with different environments, that creates a, a, a lot of noise. So we cannot see the signal if the noise of variables is so, so um, intensive. Another, ability, another possibility for this conflicting data is something that we call publication bias. This is a tendency for selective publication of research studies based on their results, and some studies with positive findings are more likely to be published than studies with negative findings. So possibly we found studies that they found the bilingualism advantage, and all the data that had no effect, no differences, maybe they are in the um, file cabinets of some researchers. So maybe we don't have the whole picture and this creates this conflict. Those are just um, speculations. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I'm very interested to find out what's going on and why the bilingualism advantage sometimes is evident and sometimes is not. Sometimes 
you see it, sometimes you don't see it, and this is really very interesting. Um, okay, this is the, the reference for this very interesting study between monolinguals. Um, and let me answer some questions. The first question is, what is the role of the number of languages known? Does the number of languages known and spoken create different types of um, bilinguals? Yes, this is possible. This is a recent um, study about the bilingual advantages and multilingualism, and um, uh, they estimated how many languages the bilinguals spoke. So they had um, bilinguals with two languages, multilinguals, multilinguals with three, four or five languages, and it seems that had an effect. Their conclusion is that there is correlation and regression analysis shown that multilingualism impacts both verbal shorter memory and verbal working memory. In particular, all analysis showed that number of known foreign languages was the strongest predictor of verbal shorter memory and working memory capacity. So it seems that how many the languages are create more or less bilingualism in the mind. This is one possibility, as I said, they are all speculations. I'm just trying to answer this question. The other question that we need to answer is what exactly that, where exactly does the cognitive advantage lie? Where, where exactly in those several systems? Especially for working memory, it seems that the phonological loop is not affected very much. The visual spatial sketch part also resists, is not affected that much for, from uh, multilingualism. The central executive, not that much, but there are some evidence for an improved central executive among uh, multilinguals. And we, we don't know very many things about the episodic buffer. Episodic buffer is a rather new system in the working memory model. It's the system where we bind information and we hold this information as a whole. And we didn't know very many things about this system. Is it possible that this is the system of working memory that can be benefited from um, um, multilingualism? Um, I, I was very interested in that. Um, uh, we found only one research on this uh, topic and they contrasted the performance of bilingual and monolingual children in a classic color shape binding task this is a task that estimates episodic buffer and they found no differences nevertheless i had a bilingual student i had my student mariana pope and we ran a small project about um, bilingualism and binding and we wanted to estimate the um, episodic buffer capacity among monolinguals and bilinguals and see if there is something there. Um, let me explain what binding is. It is an automatic and perceptual process. Binding depends on the attentional control and the function of the central executive. It is something that it is um, done within the working memory system and it is very important for several activities. So what we did is we had a very small group of multilinguals, 35 of them, and they were um, um, bilinguals of different languages, and a small group of monolinguals, 35 Greeks. We compared them on only episodic buffer tasks. I, I will show you the tasks, and I will explain to you how we can assess episodic buffer capacity. So we created, we created those, those tasks. Uh, it was not um, easy to estimate their ability to bind information. We created a task of simple visual binding, a task of a demanding visual binding, a visual spatial uh, binding task, and a multimodal binding task. The tasks are like that. So you see an item, and then there is a break. You don't see it again. So you have to recall it from your memory and you have to compare it, what you see now, and you have to identify if it is exactly the same in color and in shape. 
So it is a simple task, but you have to remember um, items in your mind and they, they increase, there are more and more. And um, you have to recognize if the item is correct. This is uh, a good estimation of your ability to hold in your mind uh, and recognize shapes and colors. This is by the shape and color. The other task was a more demanding task, was a visual uh, binding task, demanding, with several items. So again, you have one item and you have to recognize it uh, um, among several other items. It has to be exactly the same, not only the shape, but it has to be the same in color and shape. Uh, they had several, several items uh, and we, we estimate their capacity. We created another task that was a bit more demanding because in this case, you had to remember, again, you had an item, the item disappears, you have to recall it from your mind and you have to recognize if it is exactly the same with the ones that appear in front of you now. But in this case, you had to remember uh, if the item was the exact same, the exact color and in the exact position. So you have to see if this one is exactly in the same position, exactly the same color and exactly the same shape with that. You have to remember and you have to be correct with several, several um, trials. And that was a bit more um, complicated. That was a multimodal binding. Again, you see a letter and you have um, to remember if this letter was um, in the same position and the same color as the ones that they appear in front of you now. Uh, again, several um, trials, and we estimated their biting ability. I'm sorry if this is not very clear, but we had very clear evidence. We found differences, and we found that this very small group of our um, bilinguals were better on those biting tasks. They could, for some reason, uh, remember better and more accurately those items. So among the four tasks, the one, the symbol, um, the more demanding, and uh, the, the third task, they differed with um, bilinguals being better than monolinguals, why they were at, at, at exactly the same age at the educational level, but they don't differ at the final task, which was the most demanding. That was um, a surprise. We would expect them, if they differ on every task, to differ also on those final tasks. So again, it seems that um, it is much more complex than we want to think, how uh, bilingualism affects the mind and how affects working memory and its um, system, the episodic buffer. So our conclusions are that a clear advantage of a bilingual group over the monolingual observed for the visual binding tasks of four and six items and on the visual special binding task. So we found that bilingualism seems to contribute to an advanced episodic buffer function and a better binding ability. Nevertheless, performance on the multimodal binding task of binding multimodal verbal spatial information scores did not differ. Monolinguals and bilinguals were exactly the same on this very demanding task. So the question we have to answer is when does bilingualism matter for working memory? Uh, as I said, for several years, I was very interested in that. And again, I had uh, another very brilliant uh, student, Maria Andreu, and we, we ran some research on when this advantage appears, when. Um, we had some evidence that bilinguals with literacy in both languages outperform bilinguals with literacy in only one language. So it seems that it's not only the use of the two languages, but it's also the ability to read and write in both languages. So if you are um, you have literacy in both languages and you go deep into language, 
then you can get the advantage, not only when you speak it, because there are several languages that you can speak, but you cannot write and you cannot read very well. But if you read, if you have education in two languages, then you might be another type of bilingual. So it's the, the literacy, the reading and the writing that affects the brain. We had some evidence. Uh, uh, we knew that bilinguals attending a bilingual educational setting outperform the bilingual children that attend a monolingual educational setting in terms of cognitive abilities. And we ran a very nice research. We studied the functioning of working memory and cognitive updating ability in bilingual and monolingual children that were between 8 and 12 years old. That was very interesting because we compared monolinguals and bilinguals, and then we split our bilingual group in two different groups. So we had 60 bilingual Greek Albanian speaking children. Um, there are very many of them who live in, in Greece. Unfortunately, there is no an Albanian school. So the Albanian is a language that they speak with their parents, the siblings, they speak in them in the house, but there is no school. So they, they are bilinguals, but they go in a, a monolingual educational system. So they go to the Greek school. And also 60 monolingual Greek-speaking children, again, the same age, the same um, intelligence, and the bilingual children were divided into groups. 30 children attending a balanced educational setting, and 30 children attending the Greek monolingual educational system. Those 30 children who were attending a, a balanced educational setting, we, we had great difficulties to find them. So we had to travel to Albania and found Albanians who used to be in Greece, they were bilinguals and they returned back and now they are in a balanced environment because in Albania there are schools with with Greek and Albanian languages taught in the school. This is very nice. I wish we had some uh, of those schools here. So what we found, again, I'm sorry if it is not very clear, but I will explain this graph. So when we compared them, um, uh, the monolinguals and the bilinguals, we found no difference as two groups. But when we split the bilingual group into groups, the ones with a balanced educational system, Albanian and Greek, and Greek in school, and the others with only Greek in school, we found that they don't differ in the two working memory tasks, the verbal and the visual working memory, but this final task, which is um, a, a, a complex memory task, this is uh, the updating task, this is where they differ, and they differ in this way. The ones who were in the bi-educational system, the ones who had in school Greek and Albanian, those were the uh, bilinguals who had the advantage. So it's not about using and um, speaking uh, and knowing a language, but it's about going to an educational environment that is balanced. It seems that that's where from the advantage comes from. So if if um, I have to conclude on something, what we found is that bilingual children attending a balanced bilingual education setting were significantly superior to their monolingual peers and to bilingual children attending a monolingual educational setting in terms of their working memory and cognitive updating abilities. The bilinguals attending a monolingual educational setting did not differ from the monolinguals in any of the executive functions. Again, uh, we have to be very careful with conclusions and um, we have to speculate everything, but the results provide an opportunity to attribute the bilingual advantage to the use of the two languages while attending a bilingual school context. It seems that school is very important, education is very important, and when, where the educational system is balanced with two languages, this seems to be very good for the children. 
at least that was our um, findings. So again, if um, I need to go back to our questions and our answers, what we asked, what uh, we found, what is the role of the number of languages I know? Number of known foreign languages is a predictor of working memory capacity. Where exactly does the cognitive advantage lie? Bilingual advantage may indeed exist in some aspects of working memory, but not in all. When does bilingualism matter? Um, for cognition, okay? Bilingualism matter always and for several things, but especially for cognition and for working memory, Bilingualism affects the functioning of cognitive mechanisms by interacting with other factors such as educational context, socioeconomic factors, and individual differences. Um, this is from me. Thank you for using your working memory to attend this uh, presentation, possibly in um, um, a foreign language and uh, with my uh, Greek accent. And thank you very much for that. Uh, I hope it makes sense.